Welcome to The Breakdown, where we break down the most disturbed movies. Y'all know me, your boy Spooky Rice, and I hope that y'all can join me on a long-awaited breakdown. Today, we venture into the horrific film showcasing child kidnapping, murder, rape, and sadism, otherwise known as Solo, or 120 Days of Sodom. Solo details the kidnapping of almost 20 teens by four wealthy libertines, the Duke, the Bishop, the magistrate and the president. Collectively though, I might often call them the ultimate depravity. Silo is considered a very disturbing and controversial film, first being premiered at a film festival three weeks after the director was murdered by being run over multiple times by his own car. Regardless, this sick tale is like a more disturbing version of Danganronpa, and all that transpire on the grain often puts this film arguably as the most disturbing film of all time. If you want to see what happens, including all the messed up parts, let's get into the breakdown. Cue to Gohan. First, let's establish the place and time, which the film tells us is northern Italy during the Nazi fascist occupation, 1944 to 1945. The first chapter, Anti Inferno, starts off showing the four wealthy men, aka the ultimate depravity, all signing some sort of document, finishing it off by saying, all things are good when taking to excess. In other words, they have an abundant lifestyle. This document they all sign so happens to be an agreement that each man will marry the daughter of another. We then cut to three boys riding out of Grove Street, but they stop in their tracks, seeing armed men waiting for them. They retreat, but are soon captured by those men who hold them at gunpoint. While that goes on, two other boys are also held at gunpoint by soldiers of some sort. The three bikers and these two boys will be a part of the guard and soldier staff for the ultimate depravity. Then a few of the guards come into the mansion where the daughters of the ultimate depravity are sitting in wait. They spit in one's face and she slaps his dirty ass right back. But a guard in the back says, we're just following orders, dragging all four of the girls out of the room and into where their depraved rich fathers are. The marriage where each man marries the daughter of another libertine happens off screen. But we then cut to the ultimate depravity and their staff examining a bunch of kidnapped teens. The four libertines ask for the names of three of them, Claudio, Franco, and Sergio, and they are told to show their privates. The libertines respond that they will do. Wherever the depraved are sure to go, kidnapped teens are told to line up, laughing at their situation and wanting to put fear in them that they will be deflowered. Next, the four men wait at a place full of girls who are most likely there because of corrupt keepers that probably sold them off or something. The girls are brought in before the depraved and are stripped for the possibility for being chosen. This girl is kicked out because she was missing a tooth though. The third girl is a sadder case because she was kidnapped right after being forced to see her mother get murdered. This girl's anguish just sexually excites all four men though. We see a sign saying Marzabato, which houses a huge palace where many of those kidnapped boys and girls will go. Before they get there though, one of the boys tries to escape through the woods, but is shot down and murdered. You could argue it was foolish, but if so, then I'd love to be a fool. This boy got a better end than a lot of the kids still stuck in captivity. Now there are only eight boys and nine girls left to be a part of the sick preparations of the ultimate depravity. All the kids are assembled in front of the men who tell them that you are all creatures of our pleasure. Nobody knows you are here and you will follow our laws. The laws include things like, if you are caught having private sex, then you will lose a limb. If you do any sort of religious act, you will die. The next chapter is Circle of Manias, which focuses on a middle-aged prostitute named Signora, who will be a storyteller for the men and victims. Her job is to tell stories with full detail to sexually excite the depraved. She talks about a sexual encounter in vulgar detail, describing getting a facial, but is stopped by the magistrate for holding back details like how big his penis was and stuff like that. She continues her story, but turns out that this 
sexual encounter she is explaining happened when she was literally seven years old or younger. She adds more to the perversion, saying she urinated into her sexual partner's mouth. This nasty ass story got one of the men so excited that he makes one of the boys give him a hand job. But his hand job needs some work according to Signora. Next is dinner time and the kidnapped girls are forced to bring food out new to everybody. One of the studs, which are like guards, trips one of the girls on purpose. He then rapes her as all the other studs laugh and watch. This prompts one of the depraved, the president, to get up and moon everybody. He then runs up to his rapist stud and says, my turn, getting sodomized with his sick sexual smile. Next we see a girl who had her throat slit for trying to escape. After showing the example of a disobedient person, Signora starts up another story about an anal sex encounter she had when she was 9 years old. We then cut to two kids, a boy named Sergio and a girl named Renata being forced to orgasm and then they are forced to participate in a weird wedding. Just remember that Sergio was this boy, while Renata was the girl who lost her mother to these depraved kidnappers. While the marriage goes on, the duke fondles every single living organism in that room. All the new kids are then forced out to allow the newlyweds to fondle each other against their wishes. They do what they are told, but before penetration happens, they are stopped by the ultimate depravity, saying that virginity is reserved for them. Two of the depraved libertines then rape both kids before a third one comes in and sodomizes one of his fellow libertine friends. Later while Signora tells another sadistic story, the bishop drags the girl into the bathroom just to watch her urinate and masturbate. Later, all of the kidnapped kids are forced to act like dogs and even forced to fest for treats. When one of the boys, Lamberto, refuses to eat, he is chased around the room and is whipped bad by the magistrate. The magistrate then decides to get some cake and put some nails in it, giving it to a girl who eats it and screams in pain. These screams remind me of Jennifer Hill's 1978 by the way. After, the victims and their captives sit in the ballroom again, but the duke starts kissing on his favorite teen named Reno. Reno's attraction towards the duke sets him apart from the other victims, and it also saves his life. The next chapter is Circle of Shit, and trust me, it gets very shitty. Another woman gets ready for storytelling, and her name is also Signora. I'll call her Shit Nora, and you will see why in a bit. She is disgusting, and that's just being nice. She explains how she defecated in front of a client once, and even fed the shit to the client, who ate it no problem. She also explains how she killed her mother, which reminds Renata about her murdered mother. Her cries sexually excites the Duke, and he calls his studs to undress her as she cries and begs for God to kill her. Well, if you remember, any religious acts are against the law and are punishable by death. But since she is asking for death, they promise to punish her in a more sickening way. The Duke defecates in a bowl, calling Renata over saying your meal is ready. She does what she is forced to do, even when it's surely extremely disgusting and tough to swallow. The president is so aroused at the sight, going to the bathroom to masturbate as shit Nora talks about how good diarrhea is. The sick president was so aroused that he forces all of the kidnapped victims to defecate in bowls for the purpose of forced consumption later. At dinner time, here is the main course, shit, which is given to everybody. If you ain't eating, you will eat it. Also, I don't know why Sergio here is a bride now, but God bless him. Meanwhile, the Duke. Yes, exactly. It's exactly what you think it is. He comes back out asking the woman to organize an event to find out who has the best butt out of all of the kids. Whoever has the best butt though will be killed immediately. They look at all the buttocks in the dark, finding the one with the best butt. They hold him up, put a gun to his head, and pull the trigger, but no death. They tell him that death won't come so easy. We will kill you a thousand times all the way to eternity. 
The boy probably wished for death, really. The next and final chapter is Circle of Blood. The ultimate depravity, all dressed in weird dress, being the bride for their favorite stud. They didn't have sex with their stud, but after sex, the bishop leaves to examine the rooms where all the victims are. One of the boys wakes up though, snitching on one of the girls, saying that they have a photograph hidden. The bishop goes to that girl who also snitches, saying that two other people are privately having sex, which is against the rules. Then that girl snitches, saying that one of the guards is having sex with one of the servants. The duke brings the other three libertines, and they get ready to shoot at the guard. The guard is aware of his fate, and delivers a socialist salute before being shot to death. They then kill the servant as well. Next, all the remaining kids are lined up, about to learn their fate. Whoever gets a blue ribbon will die a painful, agonizing death. We don't actually see the passing out of the ribbons, but we do see the people granted to live, which includes Reno, who is the Duke's favorite. Everybody else sits in the bathroom in a shitty tub, praying to God. These kids are then brought out to the courtyard as three of the ultimate depraved and their studs get ready to murder them as one of the depraved watches from the palace. Firstly, one of the kids has their penis burned off. Another gets his tongue cut out. A woman is raped before being hanged. A boy's eye is cut right out of his head like it was nothing. A girl is scalped, which looks pretty messed up. A lot worse than when Jerry was scalped in House of a Thousand Corpses or that girl in Hostel 2. As the ultimate depraved dance, we see the pianist leave her piano, finding a window and jumping out of it meaning that the events around her throughout the movie gave her strong grief. The movie ends as two remaining soldiers bump to music, dancing together as if those 120 days of Sodom was nothing. And that's enough. Silo details the suffering of many teens for the pleasure of sick adults. The only people who did survive in the end were people who were sadistic themselves. I'm happy to get through this film, and I definitely do think it deserves its spot as one of the top 10 disturbing movies at least. Now that we have seen the pravity of all sorts, let's talk about the most disturbed moment and most enjoyed moment, and that's spooky stuff. Cue the Gohan. What a crazy film here. Even if you have seen a recap here, I request that you watch the movie yourself to actually get immersed. Now, if you didn't know, this movie is based on a book, which itself takes place in medieval times. With stories like this though, you can't look at it as a movie being reflected from the sick thoughts of a director. You should look at it like this. Damn, I wonder if something like this could even really happen. If there's anything I can take from watching all these messed up movies, it's that rich people can be sick fucks. Here's a fun fact though, the director was planning to make a film about the child murderer Zeal DeRay. If he didn't die, that could have been worse than this movie. So let's get right into the rankings. The most disturbed moment is for me, a tie between Renata eating shit and the death of all the victims. The thing about the deaths of all the victims is that music was playing the whole time. So you had to imagine the pain the characters were going through. The most enjoyed moment is, okay, look, y'all don't take this the wrong way, but the president's jokes. I didn't mention them because they weren't important, but he made some pretty funny jokes. Sometimes, sometimes. And well, that's it. Solo is here now, so I don't have to see all your comments asking for it again. If you enjoyed this video, I would love if you could click the like button. And if you're new here and just like these little recaps that I have, uh, subscribe, stay tuned for more. Here on the left is Cannibal Holocaust, another famous classic film you probably heard of. Here on the right is, <laughs> as of February 18, it's not here yet, but trust me, I hope you're ready for it. Thanks for watching, Spooky out.